My hair, my god. Okay, I really don't care. I don't. I, I just don't. What am I missing? Oh yeah. Hello Shinder Troopers, Soldier First Class here, back with a different type of video I hope to be more consistent on this channel, and that is movie reviews. I just find myself obsessed with movies after I watch them. I always want to talk about them with somebody, so I guess this could be my outlet. I'm pretty sure my videos are going to be subpar at the very least because I do not know how to do any video graphics or animations or anything like that. But hey, as long as I get what I want to say out there, I'm fine. Okay, so today's video is going to be the 2019 version of Aladdin. This movie stars Mina Massad, Naomi Scott, and Will Smith. I hope I'm saying that right. So if you're watching this video, you probably already know that Will Smith being the genie is like controversial at best. People don't really like the fact that he's blue, but we'll get into that later. Anyway, a little bit about me about this video, if that makes sense. I had no intention to see this movie. I really didn't. Not at all. Even though I liked the old 1992 version when I was a kid, I kind of went into this movie not really expecting much, mainly because I wasn't really going to watch it. I wanted to, but long story short, my dad promised my brother that he would take him to see it. When my dad bailed, my brother got sad, so I decided to take him. I was just getting home from work, so I said, what the hell? Quite honestly, right up until I actually sat down, I wasn't that excited for it. I knew what the movie was, but I hadn't really done any research about it. But then I had that inner dialogue and I was like, you know what? Let's not be that type to judge movies before we even see it. Let's just give it a go. So I did some research on this movie and it wasn't really research. It was just people whining and griping about how they didn't like the movie. And I found out that a lot of people were not looking forward to it, mainly because Will Smith is blue. He's the genie. Which is totally fine, guys. Come on, really? So Will Smith being the genie shocked thousands beyond all belief when the trailer first aired. And I'm not gonna lie, I was one of those people. I didn't know how I felt about it. Even now. Just kidding. I like him. Okay, so these people were just raving about how they did not want the genie to be blue and how it's doing such a disservice to Robin Williams. To that I say, shut up. The thing about movie remakes is, well, if they already did it... <laughs> They already did it. There is literally nothing you can do anymore. The movie's been made. Get over it. Stop being a whiny little... Give the movie a chance before you jump into your huge movie critic mode and just completely bash on it before you even see it or hear it. That being said, the day before I listened to Will Smith's version of Friend Like Me and absolutely fucking hated it. I thought it was trash, which is why I had absolutely no hopes going in. I wasn't really sure how the movie was going to play out until the opening scene. So anyway, I'll probably run my mouth a little bit more about this during the review, so let's just jump straight into it. Why does everybody say that? Let's just jump straight into it. Let's just climb up into it. Are you supposed to script these movie reviews before you do them, or can you just go on them willy-nilly? I guess we'll see. So Aladdin 2019 opens up with Will Smith's character and his two kids and wife. Will Smith's trying to get some work done around the boat and his kids are like, sing for us, sing for us, to which I was thinking, oh god, no. This brings me to my first point. We already know that Will Smith is going to be playing the genie, so it's interesting to wonder what is going to be going on with this little scene right here. Does it take place before the movie? Does it take place after the movie? Either way, it was pretty cool to wonder whether or not we were going to get some backstory on the genie. So despite saying he wasn't going to sing, he ends up singing for the kids. And it turns out to be the first song of the movie, Arabian Nights. Let me just say, he actually doesn't do that bad. Like, uh, this is where I start reconsidering my whole, you know, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I need some context in these songs. Yeah. Once Will Smith starts singing, we are introduced to Agrabah. I like how they say it. Agrabah. Like there's something caught in your throat. Agrabah. <laughs> Agrabah. The camera pans to the Cave of Wonders where Jafar is leading his... who knows what number of victim. And the film kind of glosses over that and we're left wondering, are they assuming that we know the story or... No, it's fine. I heard a lot of people complain about that. I was concerned with this at first, but it really doesn't matter. It ends up being okay. 
We end up learning enough about Jafar in the future to understand what he was doing in that scene. Another gripe people had is how Jafar wasn't the old man in this movie. I was one of those people. It really ends up not being a big deal until we get to the Cave of Wonders. More on that later. The camera ends up going back to Agrabah and we're able to see Jasmine and Raja for the first time. Kind of a little glimpse of all the characters and who we're going to end up dealing with. Which leads us to the introduction of Aladdin. Which is pretty much my favorite part of the movie. The next couple minutes is pretty much a beat by beat version of the old Disney version. I absolutely love this because it tells you this is the movie that you grew up with. But it's also a movie that has its own style. This movie does a great job of paying respect to the original version. They never once say that they're trying to do things better or that they're going to do too much to change the source material. They understand that the 1992 version was a classic and they do a lot to pay homage and respect to it. <laughs> So we meet Aladdin and Abu and it works. Mina does a good job. There are a few moments where Mina tries to act like the cute cartoon version of Aladdin which doesn't really translate well live action, but he makes it work. We get to the part where Aladdin decides to show us his personality. Instead of an apple he gives a couple kids some dates, which I don't see why it matters. I read one comment that said, why couldn't they just keep the apple? Dates actually make a little bit more sense, I don't know why. So after our introduction to Aladdin, the camera pans and we meet Jasmine almost right away. Now there's a couple things here with this scene that I'm not quite too sure what to make of. You'll hear me talk about this a lot, but I haven't seen the 1992 version in quite some time. But in this version, now that I'm an adult, I start to think about it and what the hell was Jasmine doing? One of a couple things happened. Either she took the bread because she forgot that she was a princess or she took the bread and had no intention of paying the dude back. What? That's always something that I was curious about watching this movie. I was like, why did she take the bread? Did she forget she was undercover? Or... Who knows? We then move to the next scene where Aladdin helps Jasmine from getting her arm chopped off. And this guy is hilarious. This merchant tries to call out Aladdin by... announcing his presence to everybody nearby. He's like, Aladdin, you street rat, are you trying to steal from me? And I'm just like, who is he talking to? Like, everybody? Jasmine explains that she wasn't stealing, which almost confirms the fact that she either forgot she was undercover or just didn't give a So during Aladdin and Jasmine's conversation with the merchant dude, in order to save Jasmine, Aladdin's like, here, take this bracelet. And Jasmine's like, no, 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 my bracelet. Again, I'm not so sure if Aladdin had good sleight of hand in the 1992 version or if they made it a point to show you that he was, but this movie does. So we're like, oh, okay, Aladdin's good with his hands. <laughs> Aladdin saves her and then we get to my favorite part of the movie. So before the song One Jump Ahead even started, I knew for a fact that they were going to incorporate some parkour into this. Well, I think about it, it's a modern movie, we have a street rat. He's totally going to jump from building to building doing flips, cartwheels, and dodge rolls. I'm not saying I'm psychic, I'm just saying it was nice. I like parkour. It just seems like something a modern Aladdin would do, you know? It was pretty cool to see. I mean, who doesn't love parkour? Side note, what was up with those fast forward scenes? It kind of took me by surprise. So they'll just be walking and singing and Aladdin's like, one jump, I have the bread line. Interesting visuals. Another thing I want to point out is the fact that Aladdin's not a martial artist. I was really afraid of them doing that. Aladdin doesn't know how to fight. He's a homeless dude that steals for a living. You know in some movies when the main character who like comes from nothing just seems to know how to fight, and didn't happen here. He's ducking and dodging, and it was a breath of fresh air. Nothing else to say about that scene. It was awesome. It's my favorite part of the movie. It introduces Aladdin and Jasmine perfectly, and it's almost just like the 1992 version. All right, from what I remember, I think they cut right after that to Jafar. And let me just say this. I don't have a lot of gripes about this movie. You may hear me pointing some things out, but that's just my thoughts. Jafar's actor does not work well for me. He just seems off. He looks a little too young and he's not really snarly enough. You know how the old Jafar is like, Aladdin, back to your hole, street rat. I will not allow you to bother the princess anymore. That was actually a line from Kingdom Hearts. But it's still the same voice actor. So the Jafar in this movie is like, I'm not second best. Don't say I'm second best. I'm the most powerful person in the room. He's a whiny little bitch. They just give Jafar this immature tick, like he doesn't like being second best. He flips out on one of his servant people because they call him second best. But I guess it's okay. They try to give him a backstory, which, 
Don't even get me started. Okay, so the backstory for Jafar is he used to be just like Aladdin and then somehow swindled his way up to being the Sultan's advisor. That sounds great. It really does. But then when you get to the end of the movie, you realize that the only reason they did that is so that he could steal the lamp at the end. More on that later. Aladdin and Jasmine bond a little bit over the fact that their parents taught them the same song. Which I kind of like. They kind of connect the characters a lot more than they did in the original. Uh, what's going on here? We then learn a little bit more about Aladdin and see how smart and observant he is. He's like, you must be from the palace because you're way too fine in those clothes. I think they spend a little bit more time in this film having Aladdin and Jasmine form a bond with each other right off the bat. Then we have a little bit more backstory. I'm not sure if it was in the 1992 version, but I guess Jasmine's mother died because she was killed on the streets of Agrabah, so the Sultan won't let her out. It's kind of interesting. They could have connected this to uh, Jafar's character arc, but they don't. And then we have this unnecessary bit that is just there to add tension. So Jasmine and Aladdin go to leave to take her back to the palace. Jasmine asks for her bracelet back and Aladdin's like, I don't have it. And she's like, you really are a thief. That full 30 sex, sex. That full 30 seconds of tension falls short because we know that she's not gonna be mad at him for long. But it gives Aladdin a reason to sneak into the palace. So it works. All right, so I can't get over this part. When Aladdin is singing the reprise of One Jump Ahead, the camera zooms in on his clothes and why are they so clean? No dirt, no dust. I don't know, it's a movie. All right, so the next scene, Jasmine meets her suitor. This guy from Scotland, and he's friggin' hilarious. The way he talks just makes me smile because they're like, okay, they, they're really going at it with this one. Thinking about this scene makes me laugh because it makes me think about the scene Aladdin's about to have in about 20 minutes, and it's not much better. A lot funnier, but not much better. The scene is, Aladdin's not, is what I meant. So this prince from Scotland talks incredibly funny. He's like, mm, I know what that is. It's a pussycat with stripes. I guess the guy hasn't seen a tiger before. I know what that is. It's a pussycat <laughs> with stripes. That whole scene, I think, is geared towards Jasmine, obviously. But her mindset is unclear. I'm not sure if she's pissed off at Aladdin or not having her bracelet, but she's just pretty rude to the guy. She really doesn't have a reason to be mean to him. I mean, she just met him. He pretty much has what a prince should have, servants, money, all that good stuff. But I think the real reason she's mad is because she obviously wants to be Sultan. All right, now we get to the scene which really brings out my movie critic mode. I love this movie. It's really awesome, really well done. It's really respectful to the original, but we learn the goals of one of the main characters and one of the villains, and they just seem to fall short in the end. So Jafar is talking to the Sultan, and we learn about Shirabah. Shirabah is the home place of Jasmine's mom, and for some reason Jafar wants to attack it. We're not really given a reason on why he hates this place so much. He's just like, it will better our situation if we attack them. Sultan's like, nah, no, I'm not gonna have it, can't do that. Jafar's like, we need to invade Shiraba. And the Sultan's like, no. Jafar's like, we need to invade Shiraba. And the Sultan's like, no. Then Jafar's like, Imperio, do it. And the Sultan's like, all right, fine. And then of course, Jasmine walks in and is like, what do you mean invade Shiraba? Let's just back it up for a second. I mean, Jafar, that, <sighs> okay, so Jafar is number one intention. The only intention, the only goal he has in this movie is to invade Shiraba. And we're not really told why. I think they make a couple of mentions to the fact that Shiraba might attack them or that it will better their economy or something. I don't know. But Agrabah doesn't look to be doing too bad. Side note, I do like the fact how they're making this movie a little bit more modern. The whole, you know, Jasmine don't need no man type thing. Mm. Nope. And then with Jafar, they don't really make his number one goal to marry Jasmine. He actually has a reason that he think will benefit Agrabah, or so we think. Anyway, so Jasmine bursts into the room and is like, what do you mean invade Shiraba? And of course snaps Sultan out of his mind control. Let me just start off by saying Jasmine should have been there during this conversation. It would have been so much more beneficial to her character arc to have her sit in on the conversation and give us her opinions on what they think they should do. Because let me just say, they do an incredible job of giving Jasmine her own character arc. They give her her own spotlight, or at least they try to. Jafar says some crap about how she'll never be able to do it because she's a woman or she doesn't know anything, which just of course betters her character arc. But the thing is, Jasmine's like, father, I wanna be Sultan. And then he's like, no. At which point we totally know what's gonna happen in the end. 
Again, I like the whole modern and progressive approach to Jasmine's character, but they don't do anything with it. They set up Jasmine's character perfectly. We think something's gonna happen to her. We know something good is gonna happen to her because of the stuff that she's facing. She wants to be Sultan and everybody's telling her that she can't be because she's a woman. I like when characters thrive in the eyes of adversity, but Jasmine is never given an opportunity to do so. She doesn't deserve it. We want her to, but she doesn't. You know back in high school how we learned about dynamic and static characters? Dynamic characters move the plot forward. Static characters get moved by the plot. Towards the end of the movie, the only reason why Jasmine gets what she wants is because someone gives it to her. The movie doesn't give her a chance to get it herself. They just give it to her. Especially after her song Speechless, or is it Silent? The song pumps you up, you're like, oh shit. Something's gonna happen in the future, but it doesn't. Once again, she should have sat in on the conversation with the Sultan and Jafar. It would have been so much more better. So much more better. All right. So Aladdin's able to sneak into the palace, and then Dahlia, Jasmine's handmaiden, has to pretend like she's the princess to help Jasmine's facade. Jasmine flips out because Aladdin was able to sneak into the palace, and then we get a line from Aladdin which sums up his character perfectly. He says, If you don't have anything, you have to act like you own everything. See, if you really think about it, that is Aladdin's whole character. He doesn't steal because he wants to steal. He's a good person. He fed some people that needed it more than him. But the thing is, he only steals because he has to, to survive. He doesn't have anything. Therefore, he walks around Agrabah like he owns everything, stealing things left and right, to survive. Moving on. So Aladdin promises to come back to see Jasmine later, but of course he doesn't because he gets kidnapped by Jafar. We're trying to be fed Jafar's backstory again. Jafar's like, I was once like you. And he takes something off of Aladdin's person. Which again, would have really held up except for the fact that they only use that backstory so that Jafar can steal the lamp at the end of the movie. It really means nothing. The camera zooms in and we get a beautiful shot of Aladdin's long, clean nails and garments that look like they just got out of the washer and dryer. Hey, kudos to them for paying attention to detail. They don't have nail clippers, but they do have a washer and dryer, somehow. Also, he tells Aladdin about the Cave of Wonders, obviously, but he says it in a way in which I want to know more about the backstory. If you ask me, I'd trade Jafar's backstory for the backstory of the Cave of Wonders. Where did the genie come from? So, Aladdin makes it to the Cave of Wonders and finds a lamp. Which, by the way, the Cave of Wonders looks beautiful. It really looks good. It's not as big as the cartoon, obviously, but it works. They meet the carpet, and the carpet looks great. He really does. It doesn't look too flashy. The CGI is really good on him. They also did a real good job of recapturing the whole Abu no moment. I, I love this. Okay, so here's my next problem. I cannot read my writing. When Aladdin is trying to escape the Cave of Wonders, of course, Carpet gets hit, and we get to that moment where Aladdin is hanging by the entrance of the Cave of Wonders. Okay, here's the funny part. Jafar is just standing there looking at Aladdin's struggle. You think you would care a little bit more. Aladdin has the thing that you've been searching for for who knows how long. He could probably fall, but you're just gonna let him because you want to stand there like... It's pretty funny. Like, it looks like he really doesn't care. So finally, he's like, first give me the lamp! And Aladdin's like, no, your hand first! And Jafar's like, first give me the lamp! And Aladdin's like, fine. So he gives it to him, and Aladdin's like, your hand! Jafar's like, yeah, about a foot! Ah. Ah. But not before Abu steals that lamp. So they fall. Alright, brace yourselves. Here's the part of the movie that's criticized. Alright, so here we are. So Aladdin rubs that lamp and Will Smith comes out. You know, now that I say it like that, it sounds like a parody that would have been on Saturday Night Live. Like, if we would have been told 10 years ago that Aladdin was going to rub the lamp and Will Smith was going to come out, it would have been like... What? Like that one movie, you ever see Kazam? which is pretty much like Aladdin. You have a kid who turns on a boombox and Shaq comes out. I'm not kidding, that's a movie. Here's where we can start talking about Will Smith as a genie. He's really not that bad. In the end, I wouldn't have minded if they put the blue genie in there a little bit more. So the genie comes out and he has this cool little tornado underneath him. It's not just like a string blue line like in the original, and it works. You can even see in some scenes how the tornado is making him sway back and forth. It's pretty cool. Good attention to detail. Minus clean clothes. So, Will Smith pops out as the genie and we're given a pretty good introduction for him. And then we go to Friend Like Me. Once again, I hated this song coming in. I listened to the track before I saw the movie and I absolutely hated it. Like I said, I just needed a little bit of context. The song scene is visually awesome. 
I know a lot of people don't like it, but it looks pretty good. They have a lot of little bits from the original, like Genie's blue hand coming down controlling Aladdin. I really like that. The song in itself isn't as flashy or loopy as Robin Williams, obviously. Will Smith kind of pays him that respect in doing his own thing. It's a little rap and jazzy, and it works. It's good. I like it. At that moment, though, I, along with the opening and introduction to Aladdin, I, I felt like a kid again. I really did. And up till now, I think the movie has done a really good job of giving us that nostalgia. I mean, I used to watch Aladdin since I was like five or six. Mind you, the movie came out in 1992. It's my birth year. My mom even used to babysit girls, and I used to watch this movie. And, but, whoa. Earthquake, felt on cam. Boom. Jordan. Yeah. You felt that? I was like, what? That's weird. Normally our dogs bark before an earthquake. What was I saying? Oh, I guess my mom tells me I would take all the little girls that she would babysit. Not all of them at once. I wasn't like a pimp or something. But like every time she would babysit one girl, we would pretend that we were Aladdin and Jasmine and we would just go and mac out in the closet. <laughs> yeah. Your boy was a player at age five. But all in all, the scene friend like me, it was visually perfect. Not a lot bad to say about it. It's here that we get the first hint to Will Smith really paying tribute to Robin Williams by giving him respect. He's not trying to be the Robin Williams genie. He really isn't. But he knows what the genie is, and he knows what the genie has to do. So he's giving us that character. Even the writers of the original 1992 version of Aladdin said that the role was meant for Robin Williams. They didn't write it for anybody else. And I think Will Smith and everybody else know that. So they don't try too hard in trying to be like him. They just add their own flair to it while still giving us the genie that we once knew when we were young. So up to now, if you don't like the movie, you have to at least appreciate the fact that they are giving the original some respect. So after the friend like me scene, we get the whole bait and switch thing that Aladdin does from the original. Except the loophole in this one is you have to rub the lamp when you make your wish. Aladdin very sneakily does this by handing the lamp to Abu while making the wish. While in the old version, Aladdin just cons Genie into getting them out of the cave. Right before we leave the Cave of Wonders, however, the film again pays respect and tribute to the old version. Will Smith's Genie holds up a parchment which shows the old classic looking Genie with the old classic looking Sultan and the old classic looking Aladdin. It was really good. I liked it. I like little bits of them paying homage to the old version because it... Again, it shows that they're not trying to be that film, but they are paying respect to it. So, another one of my favorite scenes is right when they just get out of the Cave of Wonders, because we get the first bonding moment between Aladdin and Will Smith's genie. Aladdin and genie talk about themselves, and genie tells us how he only really wants to be free. Free. Human, he says. More on that later. Aladdin promises the genie that he'll use his last witch to set him free. I like how this movie adds a little bit more specificity to the wishes, per se. Genie tells Aladdin that there's a little bit of a gray area in saying, make me a prince, because he can just make him a prince, and he'll create him a prince that he'll have to tag along with for the rest of his life. Genie pops up all over the place during the conversation, and we can't help but think, this is the genie that we're supposed to have. It works. So Genie turns into the Will Smith version of the genie, which... Again, looks okay. Will Smith is pretty funny. The whole time Aladdin's describing Jasmine and Will Smith is just sitting there like, Who's the girl? And Aladdin's like, She's a princess. And the genie's like, <laughs> Aren't they all? I treat my woman like a queen. It's just one of those moments where you feel like you did when you watched the original Aladdin. So again, Aladdin makes his wish, make me a prince, and Genie gets to work. When I first saw Aladdin's costume, I wasn't really so sure about it. It kind of looked a lot poofy, but then I saw the old version, and, and I was like, oh, okay, that's right. So Aladdin finally uses his first wish to be Prince Ali. Now this song was really good. I liked it. <laughs> Which, by the way, if any of you guys watch Game of Thrones, go look at the Prince Ali Game of Thrones version. It's freaking hilarious. I've been obsessed with the song Prince Ali lately. I don't know why. I just really like it. It makes me think about the old version. But again, this scene was absolutely visually stunning. It was really... They really did good with the choreography, the visuals, and the singing. It does focus a little bit much on Will Smith, but um, they do in the original. But, see, in the original, when they focused on the genie, it was because he kept popping up into the crowd and kind of doing his own thing. Like, for example, when they say Prince Ali, mighty is he, and they go into the fact that he's stronger than ten regular men, genie uses his magic to make Aladdin really strong and everybody sees it. 
but they're just supposed to trust the genie's song in this one, which is fine, but it would have been cool to see... No, that was me that time. It would have been cool to see Genie use a little bit more of his magic to make Aladdin, like, you know, something that is not. All going back to the fact that he needs to be himself, and now the Genie makes him. So the Genie impressions during the song are pretty funny, even his little cross-dressing part. Guys, don't get mad at that, okay? It's just a song. It's just a movie, and it happens in the original. It's the Genie. Don't get mad. And at the end of the song, they even get the Sultan involved. They're not gonna finish the song until the Sultan, like, kind of pats his hand down kind of like he's dancing to the beat overall this scene b plus friend like me a minus all right moving on to another great part of the movie aladdin and genie meet jasmine <laughs> okay this scene is just all kinds of funny this is probably a moment where people say that the movie's trying to be a little bit too much like the cartoon but it doesn't it works aladdin has never been a prince before he doesn't know how to act professional he doesn't know how to act like royalty the whole conversation between him and jasmine He's just flubbing it the entire time. Which serves as another bonding moment between Genie and Aladdin because they're bantering back and forth. Once again, Aladdin just does not know how to talk. Nobody is really having it. The Sultan's just shaking his head like, who the hell is this guy? Jasmine's like, uh, I'm not really impressed. You have a lot of stuff. All the suitors have a lot of stuff. Prince Ali is like, we have camels. We have monkeys. And we have jam. Ah yes, the jam debacle. That was hilarious. See, Prince Ali does not know how to make himself look good, so he just starts talking about all the stuff he has, like jams, different kinds of jams, and everybody's like, oh, jams, and he's like, yeah, jams. Genie's just so embarrassed because he doesn't know how Aladdin could be screwing this up so much. So then we get to the point where Aladdin is trying to express how awesome he is because he has a whole bunch of stuff, to which Jasmine replies, what do you hope to buy with all of this? Like she was thinking what he was going to say was what he was going to say, and he ended up saying it. Jasmine's like, what do you hope to buy? And Aladdin's like, you! And I was like, mm. The look on Genie's face. <laughs> Priceless. Even the Sultan's like, well, yeah, that, that's true, but... You don't actually say that stuff. Of course he did it because he was just confused and nervous and he said it for comedic value too. But again, it just adds to the whole point where Aladdin is acting like somebody he's not. I still think he did better than the Scotsman guy. I mean, it didn't sound like Aladdin was infatuated with Raja. So this scene is where I get a little confused too because Jasmine just seems to be pissed off for all the wrong reasons. She starts talking to Dahlia, her handmaiden, about how Aladdin or Prince Ali is just another one of those guys who's trying to suck up to her father. But right when she says this, Aladdin just waves at the Sultan and walks right by him. He doesn't try to talk to him. Jasmine, what the f So, Genie decides to use his magic a little bit to make Aladdin talk to Jasmine because he's too nervous. Genie actually defies Aladdin. Aladdin tells him to stop and he doesn't. He just goes, go. Okay, so Aladdin finally talks to Jasmine and they end up dancing, which, <laughs> here's another funny point. So Aladdin finally decides to talk to Jasmine at the more formal part of the festival. Three main characters are wearing the colors from the original movie. Genie is sporting like a nice blue ensemble whilst Aladdin is wearing his gold and white. And Jasmine's wearing her nice teal. Love it. Talking to Jasmine, I think they have like a couple seconds before they start dancing. Also, is it just me, or when you watch this movie, did you also know that Genie and the Handmaiden were totally going to get together by the way they looked at each other? I mean, come on. Mile away. So the fast forward to dancing, it's pretty hilarious. It leads into the whole Aladdin acting like he's somebody he's not because he's dancing and Genie's making him. He does his backflip at the end and Jasmine gets upset. Apparently the backflip was too much because she says the backflip was a little bit too much. I don't know. But after Aladdin shows off his amazing moves, Jasmine just leaves. She just ups and leaves. Which is interesting because nobody really knows why she's upset. Is she upset because she's starting to like him and that means if she marries him he's going to be the prince and she can't be the sultan and she wants to be the sultan? I don't know. That's what I feel is going on. Or was she just really upset about the backflip? They were having a good time. He does one backflip. It's not that much of a show off. Later on, the genie decides to be Aladdin's wingman, getting the handmaiden out of her room so that he can talk to Jasmine. Meanwhile, Jafar is lurking somewhere, jealous about the fact that Aladdin knows how to dance. Because... Why is he jealous? His goal is not to have Jasmine. It's to be Sultan. What? Okay, so right before Aladdin and Jasmine decide to go on this magic carpet ride, Jasmine has this weird, I'm trying to catch you moment. It's like, I'm not really sure if she thinks magic is an option. 
If not, then why is she so suspicious? Prince Ali comes in with all this money, all these servants, and all these zoo animals. And she's like, I don't believe you. You're not a real prince. Like, are all princes supposed to know how to talk? What about the people that don't pay attention? No, but really, she's looking at a map trying to figure out if Aladdin's lying. Doesn't make sense. Why do you think he could be lying? Anyway, we get the genie's classic be yourself thing on the map, and Jasmine's finally convinced because the genie puts a babwa right at the bottom left corner. She's like, I didn't see that! And he's like, it doesn't matter, let's go on a magic carpet ride. So they go. Another thing to point out, a nice little recreation of the do you trust me moment. It's good. I like it. So after Aladdin's personality shining through the genie magic, which is going to inevitably lead to Jasmine figuring out that he's really Aladdin, we're led to the a whole new world moment. It doesn't disappoint. It's okay. I mean, it's not the best. It's not super flashy. It's it's what you'd expect the remake to be. The visuals are great. We're able to see outside of Agbra for the first time, and there's dolphins, there's water, there's mountains, there's stuff. It's nice. I'm sorry I don't really have much to say about the song, but it was okay. Afterwards, Jasmine and Aladdin have this conversation on the carpet right above Agrabah looking at the streets and its people, and it adds to her goals that end up again falling short. Even Aladdin notices that she's the one that should be Sultan, saying that only she can do it in a good way. She's like, yeah, yeah, thank you. And then automatically jumps to, so is that a boo down there? Which completely gives Aladdin away. I'm not sure if this happens in the original, but he goes through this little bit about pretending to be poor. I don't know. Interesting addition to add to Aladdin's lie. Be that as it may, Jasmine's not upset with Aladdin too long because they have that classic moment where a carpet pushes him up and they kiss. But again, we're built up to believe that Jasmine is going to do something in this movie. I keep bringing it up because the more it gets built up, the more disappointing it is. Forgot to mention, right before they kiss though, Aladdin says this line, which is really good too because it pertains to Jasmine as well. He's like, nobody sees the real you when you're royalty, which is pretty good. Because for Jasmine, it means that nobody really sees her other than a princess. They don't really want to get to know her. And for Aladdin, it means that he's really Aladdin, but nobody really sees him because he's Prince Ali. That's probably why she wanted to kiss him so bad. All right, so Aladdin is completely whipped the fact that he kissed Jasmine for the first time. Now he thinks he's going to be the prince. Genie gets a little bit upset. Okay, so I'm pretty pissed off. The whole time, the wrong microphone was on. It was capturing the audio on the friggin' webcam. That is so stupid. So Aladdin decides to go back in his words, saying that he doesn't think he can really free the genie because he has to keep up this lie. And I really liked this scene because, you know, conflicting scenes between two characters that really care about each other always get me. But the genie kind of just says, you're breaking my heart, kid, and then disappears. He does have a line where he says in the 10,000 years that he's had masters, he's never had one that he can call a friend. But then after that, he just says he's bringing his heart and disappears. Which actually makes sense now that I think about it. Because Aladdin was being a real jerk, and the genie is kind of like, not really surprised. He's been around for 10,000 years, always been put back in the lamp. He's kind of like, oh well. I knew this was going to happen. Just hoped it wouldn't. After the argument between Genie and Aladdin, Aladdin gets intercepted by one of Jafar's goons and Jafar. So apparently Aladdin's personality didn't shine through the Genie magic with Jafar because he still thinks he's Aladdin. Jafar says he doesn't believe him and if he doesn't summon the Genie right now he's going to die. So he pushes him off the tower. And then of course we have the moment where Abu and the carpet bring the lamp to Aladdin so that they could save him. I really like this scene too because it's kind of a beat by beat scene from the original. Aladdin accidentally rubs the lamp when he's unconscious, Genie pops out and ends up breaking the rules to save him. The Genie does have this line after everything happens, which I don't know how he would know, maybe because he's all-knowing, but he tells Aladdin that Jafar has everybody fooled. And you're kind of like, wait, what? When did that happen? How does he have him fooled? Alright, so we get to the point where everybody confronts Jafar because he says, I I What are you doing? I think my brother's listening to Disney songs. Alright, so we finally get to the scene where Jafar is confronted by everybody because he lied about Prince Ali walking out on them. This part doesn't really make sense because he's trying to convince that Prince Ali is just after him for his throne. Well, duh. I mean, Aladdin's not, but pretty much every suitor that she's had pretty much wants to do that. That's why they traveled so far. They just travel so far for a girl. I mean, <laughs> well, don't get me wrong. I would travel far for a girl too, but the thing is, a lot of these guys aren't. They're just in it for being Sultan. I mean, come on. Jafar uses the Emperor's Curse on the Sultan to make him think that Aladdin really is there to steal his throne, which again, who cares? 
To which Aladdin replies, ah, it's the staff. Smashes the staff in a very classic moment. Breaking the Empress curse and turning everybody on Jafar. Now here's the funny part, Jafar gets locked up. You think everything would be good, but no. Yago helps him escape and we get to the real reason why Jafar's backstory was created. For this moment right here. Aladdin is walking outside the palace for some reason. I don't, I don't know. And then Jafar uses his slate of hand to steal the lamp. Here's where you could have just uh, not done Jafar's backstory. Let me explain. So if you didn't have Jafar's backstory and you just put emphasis on his staff being able to manipulate or do a little bit of magic, it would have made sense. Because sleight of hand is very quick and sneaky. But when Jafar steals the lamp, they play this mystical music as if he's using magic. And you're like, what? I digress. It was... Okay. Whatever. So Jafar somehow makes his way through security and sits right by the throne waiting for everybody to come back and say, what are you doing here? He then shows everybody that he now has the genie and controls everything and everyone. So genie comes out seeing that his master is now Jafar. And the handmaiden sees genie and they have this moment like, what, you betrayed me? Like, why is she so upset? He's a genie. Like, All right, here's another little gripe I had. So Jafar's first wish is to be Sultan of Agrabah. So for Aladdin, it gave him subjects that were loyal and all that stuff. But for Jafar, what did it do exactly? It gave him a hat, some new clothes, but it didn't make the subjects obey. Not that I want Jafar to win, but it probably should have made the subjects obey. Or he just wasted wish. In my opinion, they probably should have just stressed the fact that he had an all-powerful genie and that everybody needed to listen to him or else. And then make his sorcerer wish. Because the way it stands right now is they missed a great opportunity. So the very first thing that Jafar does as Sultan is to attack Shiraba. That's the very first thing he says. Like, what? You did it, dude. You won. What's... You, you got what you wanted. And also, was it really that serious? Like, he really, really wanted to invade Shiraba. If anything, they could have just said that he came from Shiraba and it treated him like crap. Why does he hate it so much? Moving on. Jafar takes Jasmine and the Sultan captive. Jasmine's about to be taken away until she bursts out in song same song before and let me tell you this song really gets you hyped it really does because up till now i'm thinking jasmine hasn't done anything to deserve anything well to deserve what she wants i'm like this is it something's gonna happen she's gonna do something i didn't know what it was i mean i kind of thought she was gonna steal the lamp so she bursts out in a song amping everybody in the theater up as if she's gonna make something happen, you know, she's gonna do something to deserve the position of Sultan. And then just... Why does everybody drink water during silent moments? You gotta change it up. So, after Jasmine's huge song buildup, she makes a speech. But Hakim, their loyal guard, that's it. That's literally all she does. All that build up for nothing. She makes a speech about how Hakim should be loyal to the true Sultan. And he's just like, oh, okay, like, that's it. Really? Really? I mean, seriously, after all that, she makes a speech about Hakim. I thought she was going to say something about the subjects and how, you know what? No, you're not the Sultan. My father's not even the Sultan. I'm the Sultan of Agrabah. Like, oh, oh shit. Yep, you are. But no, nothing like that. Hakim's like, yeah, you're right. I should serve the true Sultan. I serve you guys again. Screw Jafar. What? The wish should have made him obey no matter what because he's Sultan. And if they listen to their Sultan, they have to listen to him. It just, it doesn't make sense. So after our little odd music moment that pumps you up for seemingly no reason, Jafar says something which I believe is a missed opportunity for the movie. But Jasmine and Jafar have this little argument on who really is the Sultan. She's like, oh, it's my dad. And he's like, no, it's me. I'm tired of sitting back and being second fiddle, whatever. Jasmine goes, you are destroying Agrabah. To which Jafar replies, I wish nothing but glory for Agrabah. I know you're thinking what I'm thinking. Wouldn't it have been hilarious if his hand just ever so slightly brushed up against the lamp as he said that and Genie just made a wish and it didn't really do anything? It just promised like economical glory for the rest of Agrabah's years? I don't know. 
It would have been a wasted wish, and it would have been hilarious. He still would have had his next wishes, the sorcery run and the one to become all-powerful. But no, we wasted it on the Sultan one, which didn't do anything. At all, because the people just said F it right after. Anyway, Jafar gets pissed off and banishes everybody out of the room except for Dahlia, Sultan, and Jasmine. Lyman gets caught trying to sneak the lamp, and Jafar banishes him too, to Antarctica. Here's where things get a little tricky again. So, Genie's supposed to obey his master, but he teleports Carpet all the way to where Aladdin is. That's disso freaking bane if you ask me. Now we get to the part where Jafar decides to show his true colors and say, hey, you know what, maybe marrying Jasmine isn't actually a bad idea. I want that ass. He starts whining like a little bitch saying, now you know how it feels to be second fiddle. <laughs> Why don't I just marry your daughter, everything you love? It's kind of funny because it's kind of like they're playing a joke on the original. How Jafar's intentions before were to just marry Jasmine and become Sultan because he's like lusting after her or something. And in this one, it's kind of like, uh, maybe I will just marry your daughter. Like it's the furthest thing from his mind. It works. It's progressive. Makes you think. Kind of. So Jasmine's like, okay, I'll do it. Meanwhile, Aladdin's trapped in Antarctica, doesn't know how to get back, but ends up getting back because Genie sent the carpet to him. Which shouldn't have happened. The carpet should have been banished with them. So when they finally get back to Agrabah, the battle begins. So Jafar and his subjects, which magically appear again, I guess, have the captured Jasmine, Sultan, and Dahlia right outside the balcony. Meanwhile, Aladdin is just floating by there about to save him. There's this moment where Jasmine is staring into Jafar's eyes as if she's either gonna like one, kiss him, or two, kick him in the balls, but... There is a third option. There is? And I thought it was gonna be, she's gonna take that lamp. I thought that was it. I thought this is her moment. This is what she's gonna do. She's gonna take the lamp, she's gonna make the wishes for herself to be Sultan, and then give the lamp back to Aladdin so he can wish the genie free. And then Jafar would turn into a genie and win somewhere in there, but that's what might happen in the end. Nope. That's not what happened. No luck for Jasmine doing anything dynamic. At all. So Jasmine steals the lamp, they jump off the balcony, and her and Aladdin fly away. And Iago chases him. Which now I think is an important time to point out the fact that Iago is stripped from any character at all. And I think it was given to Hakim. They reduced him to like a parrot that just laughs at Jafar sometimes. But at the same time does what he says. I don't know. So after Jafar gets the lamp stolen from him, he pulls out his digivice and helps Iago digivolve. So after Iago digivolves into War Iagomon, the chase begins. Then we play a little game of Pass the Lamp. At this point, I really didn't know who was going to get the lamp. Once again, I was really thinking it was going to be Jasmine. Chase is good. War Iagomon really does a lot, but he kind of just comes out of nowhere. Meanwhile, back at the balcony, the Sultan starts talking crap to Jafar, and he gets pretty pissed off. I thought the Sultan was trying to push over Jafar, and maybe he was, but then the Sultan's like, you're nothing without your staff. Are you just trying to knock over the staff? Hey, I'm all for characters trying, even though their attempts are futile. And it would have been a good little scene, except for the fact that... <laughs> so after the Sultan knocks over Jafar's staff, Jafar just uses the force to bring it back. And then we're shown probably the most cheesy line in the entire movie. So Jafar uses the force to bring back his staff, and he's like... <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> he friggin' hisses. There's thunder in the back and everything, and he's just like... <laughs> what? I guess they're trying to make up for the fact that he's not going to become a snake in this movie, but that doesn't change the fact that I just wanted to burst out laughing the entire time. <laughs> I still can't get over it. It's like, why? I guess he really is a snake. So after the audience learns that Jafar is a descendant from Salazar Slytherin, Iago finally steals the lamp. The chase leads everybody back to that balcony, and that's where things start to get a little off. Jafar gets really pissed off and decides to use Nairu's love to make Dahlia, the Sultan, and Jasmine all float in the air for some reason. I thought it was a bit time sensitive. I thought they couldn't breathe, but no, they could. They're just floating there for some reason. I mean, they weren't doing anything on the floor. Like, I don't know. We finally get to the part where Aladdin decides to ninja the crap out of Genie's brain. What? We finally get to the part where Aladdin decides to ninja the crap out of Jafar's head. Aladdin reminds Jafar that you're either the most powerful in the room or you're always just second best. And since Jafar is a whiny little bitch, he gets all pissed off. Which leads me to one of the last little points I want to make about this movie. So we don't know where the genie came from. I think the TV shows of Aladdin on Disney might have explained it at some point. In this movie, we don't know what's going on. If somebody made the genie, that means they're more powerful than the genie. Which means if Jafar wishes to be the most all-powerful being in the world, he wouldn't be the genie. Because one, somebody created the genie, and two, the genie is limited. So, 
Why didn't you add the word genie in that wish? Why didn't you add the word genie in that wish? It's what he says in the original. I mean, this out of all the things that you decided to change that I actually really liked, you're not gonna say genie? Genie. I know what they were going for with the whole gray area thing, but now I just feel like it was up to the genie when Jafar made that wish and he really didn't become the most powerful being in the world. Genie, my final wish, make me an all powerful genie. That's the line, that is the line. I mean, now I'm sitting here thinking, is a genie really the most powerful thing in the world? Jafar sees that, he sees that. Maybe that's why he didn't say genie, but Genie took it upon himself because there's a gray area. I don't know. A little bit confusing. We get about five seconds of buff Genie, and then it kind of falls short. I mean, we don't even get that part where Aladdin says, All right, Jafar, back in your lamp. So the whole climax kind of wraps up with Jafini. 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 That's it. So the whole climax kind of wraps up with Jafini bringing an now de digivolved Iago into the lamp with him, which tells me two things. All right, so tell me if you guys thought this too. By taking the parrot, who no longer had any character, they kind of stripped that from him. It was just a parrot. Anyway, he takes Iago, which tells us there might be a sequel. Because who helps Jafar get out of the lamp? More Iagomon. But then we get to the moment where Will Smith is freed by Aladdin. Freed. In this movie, that means he's a human. Everything wraps up pretty nicely. Aladdin apologizes to Jasmine and the Sultan, saying, I'm sorry for pretending I'm somebody I'm not. And then the Sultan says, it's completely fine. You're definitely one of the best suitors I've ever seen. I'd be happy if you married my daughter. Wink. To which Jasmine just looks irritated. She's like, no, I want to be Sultan. I don't need a prince to do that. So then Aladdin walks away, allowing Sultan and Jasmine to have their little conversation. So Aladdin walks towards the genie. And the genie is seriously acting like he knows what Aladdin's going to wish for. He's like, all right, I can take off that law for you. But of course, Aladdin doesn't want to do that anymore because he doesn't care about benefiting himself. It was a really nice scene. We really see the great chemistry between Mina and Will Smith. It's just, it's really good. It's not as emotional as the original, but it's still nice. And when he wishes him free, he's human. So they have a nice little hug. And this movie's own version of No Way is still good too, because it's more sentimental. While Robin Williams was a lot more funny. So the genie, no, well, he's not genie anymore. They might continue to call him genie. So Jin asks Aladdin to ask him for some jam, and he says, get it yourself. It's nice. It's not as cute as the other one, but it, you know, sentimental. And that's because the movie was keeping its focus, and that was on Jasmine, the woman who got a lot more screen time that we actually thought was going to go somewhere. But let's backtrack. The whole scene where Aladdin sets the genie free, there's a lot happening there, inside the movie and out. You see, inside the movie, the genie is free. He's now human. Feels like that plot is done. He's not much more stronger than Aladdin. He has no magic. Or maybe he does. I don't know. I don't think so. But that shows us that, that they're confident in no sequel. Because who's going to help them beat Jafar in the next movie? Yep. Yeah. It's really good because they're not tooting their horns saying that there's going to be a sequel. They're actually giving us a possible ending. I mean, I'd like it if they made a sequel. But with that ending, making Genie free, it opens up so many doors to have them make the next movie what they want to make it. And they no longer have to worry about disrespecting the previous 1992 version. So Jasmine has a nice conversation with her father and he pretty much tells her that he wants what's best for her because he's her father, Farger, Farger, because he's her Farger. And Farger Sultan is like, away with the law. You're Sultan now because you deserve it. She's like, oh my God, yes. Yeah. What? She's just handed Sultan like nothing. I mean, this character is built up from the beginning like something, like, her character is going to be different in this movie. And it falls short. She never actually does anything to deserve being a sultan. And once again, I'm not saying she shouldn't be. I want her to. I like the fact that she's sultan. But they didn't really bring her there the right way. You know, in the original, the law actually took precedent. We didn't have Jasmine's whole character arc and wanting to be sultan. It was just wanting to marry somebody who was Aladdin. But in this one, we're given a character arc where she has so many beats, so many goals, so many opportunities to do something with herself, to show us that she deserves it and she can handle it. But we don't get that. I honestly think she should have stole the lamp. I don't know how they would have done it, but if she would have took the lamp from Jafar right then and there and then made her wishes and then... I, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know. So he's like, that law... 
that I said I'm not going to change, I'm going to change it. And he does. And she's Sultan. Just like that. So it is really cool that they changed this movie to focus on Jasmine Wan and become Sultan. Because she don't need no man. You know? It's really good. I feel like the whole movie we're just saying, yeah, she deserves it because she don't need no man. But this isn't cut it for me. Forgot to mention, before the talk between Sultan and Jasmine, Aladdin just leaves. He just like dips. Genie has Dahlia and Sultan has Jasmine right there. They're all just talking and Aladdin just dips. He's gone. It's like, why did you leave? I guess you can argue that he thought he didn't belong there, but I just felt it out of place. The movie wraps up pretty nicely. Jasmine goes out to find Aladdin who just left the palace and she's like, stop. In the name of your Sultan. He turns around. She's like, yes, I am Queen Sultan. Yeah. They share a romantic kiss and then they get married. That's pretty much it. Needless to say, the movie was pretty good. We're brought full circle. So the scene where the man that we know is Genie, talking at the beginning of the movie, actually takes place after the movie. Since Genie is now human, he's now married Dolly and fathered two kids, a boy and a girl. <sighs> anyway, it was fun making this review. It's really my first one. I know I'm still like an amateur, but it was fun to make. This movie was great. I really think so. I had a few gripes in between, but I'd still give the movie a B+. I said this a million times already, but one thing that I'm really disappointed about obviously is just that they gave jasmine a character arc and it didn't really get fleshed out she was kind of just handed it you know really as soon as she said she wanted to be sultan we're like oh there's the end of the movie <laughs> so at the very end we have a star wars ending to which all the characters are looking towards the camera and it just says the end pretty good kind of star wars ish but you know we're giving about five seconds of credits before we go to the end credits dance scene i kind of like things like this they have all the characters from the movie very non-canon, not really continuity. They're just all dancing, having a good time. It's good stuff. We get that little fast forward scene again. Like, what is, what is with that? I don't know. Once again, this was my first review. I really had a good time making it. I should probably make a script next time because I was just everywhere and I'm gonna do a lot of cutting and pasting. Who knows how it's gonna look in the end, but oh well. So there it is, Aladdin 2019, starring Minim Asad, Will Smith, and Naomi Scott. I'll say B plus, B plus. Let me know if you guys had the same thoughts that I had when I was watching this movie. I'm hoping to do another movie review soon, probably the Ted Bundy movie. I was thinking about doing that, or um, Escape Room. And then uh, actually recently, last night, I just saw Rim of the World. <laughs> and oh, oh, I want to do a review on that indefinitely. Because I'm probably not going to say what some people think. So, excuse me. Once again, I had a really fun time making this. I hope whoever's watching, you enjoyed this too. And I hope to get out another video soon. Thanks. Peace out. Everybody says peace out. What can I do? Get something original. Choo! Hey guys, you're probably wondering what I'm doing here again. It's the end of the video and I'm still talking and I look different. I got a fresh new cut and I am Red Marker Soldier. Red Marker Soldier because I actually made a couple of mistakes in this video. After watching the movie a third time with a friend, I know, it took me three times to notice. I'm probably gonna be making a lot of mistakes in this channel, but that's okay, I'm human. If I make a mistake, I encourage you to call me out on it. It will only make me better at paying attention to detail, and it'll make my videos ten times better in the future. But I made a couple of mistakes in this movie that I actually noticed. Granted, I probably made more, but these are just the few that I actually noticed. Here's what I found out. So, one of the first things that I wrote down was... <laughs> um, I actually missed a line when Jafar was speaking to his subordinate. Turns out Jafar might have a little bit more of a reason to hate Sherabat, which is actually pronounced Sherabat, not Sherabba. But he said something that I missed, and it turns out Jafar was actually held in Shirbat jail for five years. It's a good reason to hate the place. But he also mentioned that he has put a ton of bodies in the dirt to get where he is now. Which means he probably committed murder a couple hundred times, probably to get that staff. 
So they probably locked him up because he's a freaking murderer. Dude, you hate the country that put you behind bars because you committed a crime. I still stand by what I said, but I just wanted to point out that I made a mistake by not including that little piece of evidence <laughs> on why he might hate it. So, he hates Sherbot because they locked him up for five years, but you do the same thing in Agrabah, they're going to lock you up too, so it still doesn't make sense. Also, I wanted to clarify that Jasmine does take the lamp, but what I meant was I thought she was going to take the lamp and do something with it for herself. So let's clear that up. In the dance scene when Aladdin is showing off via the genie, via, 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 the genie, I mentioned how she got a little bit upset for no reason. After watching the movie a third time, I realized that it was kind of for a reason. So towards the end of Aladdin's dance, before he does the backflip, Jasmine is walking around very impressed. Now when I watched it, I thought she went from 0 to 60 pretty fast. She was having a good time and then she leaves, but I wasn't paying enough attention to her. After Aladdin does this little move on the fountain, he actually walks back towards Jasmine and sticks his hand out Oops. like he's going to start dancing with her again. She's smiling up until he turns around and starts showing off again. So I will actually change what I said about her getting mad for no reason because it's because it's very understandable why she got mad. She thought Aladdin was going to come back and dance with her, but instead he chose to keep the spotlight on himself and start dancing by himself instead of dancing with her. So, I missed that. I was wrong. So this next thing has to do with something that somebody else helped me realize. Like I said, I went to watch this movie with a friend, and afterwards we decided to talk about it. She mentioned something pretty interesting about Jasmine that I failed to see. Like I said, I stand by what I said before, but this is an interesting view on it. My friend says... After hearing my rant about Jasmine not deserving anything, my friend Marie actually says that in her opinion, Jasmine actually did do something to prove that she should be Sultan because she cares about the people. There's a point that I missed when Jafar and Jasmine were about to be wed. Jafar is torturing Jasmine's father, and Jafar throws out the proposal for Jasmine to marry him. Jasmine said she'll do it as long as he'll stop. According to my friend, which I don't think is too good of an argument, right there Jasmine was proving that she's willing to do anything for her family and by extension, Agrabah. We then started talking about her song, Silent, or Speechless. Damn, I should probably get that right. Speechless or Silent, I forget. I don't want to look it up right now. I'm just, I have a really bad headache. But her song is specifically geared toward being silent or being silenced, being speechless. So the speech that she gives, while it is about Hakim, does add a lot to her character because it shows that she's not willing to stay silent anymore. I forget that this is a day and age where women aren't really allowed to have a voice. So it does add to her character that she's willing to speak out against her father or even the Sultan, Sultan Jafar. So I'll change what I said about speech just kind of coming out of nowhere. It does have its purpose, but once again, I stand by what I said about, you know, I'm not even going to say it. I've said it a hundred times already. Forget it. That's pretty much it. Not too much. And I'm sure I made a ton of more mistakes, ton of more, ton but it's okay. I don't plan on making a lot more mistakes on this channel, but it's probably going to happen. Like I said before, if you come across anything else that I may have missed or messed up, just let me know. I'm not perfect. The whole point of this was to get my feelings out about the movie and just have fun doing it. So yeah, comment down below if you liked it. If you don't, well, there's a dislike button and I don't care. If you enjoyed this movie, let me know what I could do better. Let me know what I could not do better because I just suck. I can never be as good as other movie reviewers. But overall, it was fun making this. And I am glad that I had time to correct this before I put it on YouTube. I knew it was missing something. I knew I was wrong about something. But that's pretty much it. This is too long already. Peace.